Hi, welcome uh, to this uh, session uh, on looking at joining the dots between, atta uh, uh, between attachment to mental health and behaviour in our, in our classrooms. Uh, my name is Ian Source and I'm the Chief Executive of Vegans. And uh, Vegans has been around for quite some time, 150 years actually, uh, uh, but throughout that time, uh, always caring for vulnerable uh, children and their families. And that's our heart today, is to stand with and alongside families and really help them to flourish. Um, today, that looks very different uh, to what we're doing back in the 1870s. Uh, we provide school-based counselling predominantly uh, to around 400, 450 children every week, even uh, in this lockdown time, mainly in schools. Uh, we provide parenting. Uh, so we do parenting interventions where families are really struggling. So it's not groups uh, for parents trying to see how they can get a bit better at parenting. This is really for those folk who are saying, you know, uh, my family are under pressure right now. How do, how do we respond to that? And we have two preschools of our own. One opened uh, a few weeks ago, a few months ago now in September. Uh, fascinating time to do that. As I stand, it's uh, mid-January. Uh, it's windy in Howley. Uh, my kids are working very soon uh, in classrooms around the, the house. So I'm banished, if you like, to the, to, to the garden room. And I just sat here going, OK, uh, let me open up my heart to you for what we're seeing uh, in our counselling and our parenting and our in our preschools. And there's also a lot of digital resources which uh, we give away free, and uh, but more of that a bit more uh, later. So uh, the aim of today, whilst we've got the fancy title, the aim of today is to provide insights into challenging behaviours um, uh, of children in school so that actually we can think about how can we respond to that. And not really at point of crisis, but really how do we minimise and diminish that as uh, uh, so they're not really happening in the first place. And that's our heart. Not just that you know, we control anything, that's not us at all. Our, our heart is to create an environment where kids can really flourish. And to that end, I'm going to hopefully uh, open up some insights as to essentially how they think, how they feel, uh, that may be really helpful to uh, all of us as we try and do that together. Um, I do have some limitations, and I just thought I'd just be open about these. I'm not an academic. I'm a chief exec of a charity uh, that cares very much for uh, children and families. Uh, but I'm not an academic, but most of what I'm going to present hopefully uh, is drawn from the academic world and, and I'm going to try and reproduce that as faithfully as I can. And because of time, I'm going to speak in general principles and there are some aspects that I'm doing here that could make a whole day just on their own and I'm going to kind of skate through them in minutes. But bear with me as I'm talking generally about things and, and I know that there are exceptions and you'll have to interpret those for your own context and what's happening for you in your environment, in your school. Um, uh, some of the things I'm going to be talking about are based on our operational experience. They're things that we're seeing, if you like, live uh, as we're working. You know, I work with families that I'm seeing live, that we, our practitioners are seeing. We're going, hmm, what does that mean? I'm going to share some of those with you because actually they, they, they might be really helpful as well. Um, but most of all, I really don't, <laughs> I don't really want to tread on your toes and your expertise. Uh, you know, I remain grateful. Um, to the care that you input into my family right now and my family's friends, my kids' friends, and, and I don't really want to do that. I'm hopefully not going to be teaching you, as I said, to suck eggs um, uh, today. So um, just covering um, some of those subjects, we're going to look at attachments, we're going to look at the child's brain and how they relate to each other a little bit. Uh, in those lights, understanding behaviour and then asking this question, how do we respond? So straight on to attachment, uh, if you like, one of my favourite subjects. Um, uh, I'm going to use a surprising quote uh, from a guy called Sir John Timpson, literally uh, Timpson's, uh, the key cut and shoe, uh, shoe polisher uh, guys that you see in all the uh, train station. Well, their founder, Sir John Timpson, um, actually fostered 90 children. And in his, um, in his experience, he, he, uh, he said, you know, this, we're doing something wrong in family. You know? And he, he wanted to gather people together and he got psychologists and psychiatrists together. And he wrote some uh, fundamental understanding, like little books about fundamentally understanding some of the principles that are happening within children's hearts and heads. And then there are three uh, Timpsons. So if you want a quick insight into some of these things, I, I encourage you to go to local Timpsons my top tip of the day, uh, and get some of these books. But he says, or at least this book says, until two, until the age of two, normal parenting forges neural pathways in the brain and provides the basis for social behaviour that will be carried on throughout life. Uh, I would simplify that, that uh, a good attachment is about the ability to say, I'm okay. 
I'm okay. But what Sir John is trying to reach for here is when a baby is born, you know, my firstborn was, was born and I, and I held her in my arms and for an hour or two, uh, as mum was being cared for and so on, I, I was holding her and I'm going, I love you. I for you. I adore you. I will not let you down. And what happens in that moment, incredibly, is that my emotional connection to my uh, eldest begins to form neural pathways. Literally, the emotional thing has a physical impact. And the reason that's amazing, I always, I think it's like a superpower. This is like Marvel Comics moment for me, because we can literally change the shape, the function, and the, even the size, scientists are saying, of a child's brain by forming these incredibly good connections at birth. And as a result of that, this child looks up and says, I know my place in the world. I know I am loved. I know I am secure. And the ironic thing about being secure, if you're rooted into a rock of security, is you're then able to understand uh, 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 the other, how other people are doing, and, and you're able to go and explore. So if good attachment is formed and, and my eldest uh, uh, grows you know, solid in who she is, uh, she'll build stronger resilience. She'll have a stronger understanding of herself and an understanding of others. She will be better at relationship building, partly because if she's rooted in and she knows that she's approved of, she's able to reach out to others and get a sense of, oh, they're different to me. That's OK. What does that look like? That's exciting. But if it's not formed and uh, we, we, we have poor attachment and we're a little bit insecure, then actually we will be less resilient to the storms of life. Children will feel more vulnerable. They will have uh, poorer social uh, skills. They won't be able to cope as well. Um, they might have poorer problem solving skills, something that very much directly impacts inside the classroom. Uh, perhaps they will act out in terms of um, uh, uh, challenging behaviours and, and perhaps be a little bit clingy or withdrawn. These things are often, but not always, generalisation, often but not always, are the root, uh, root of these, these, these poor attachment. And, and whether you take this as good news or bad news is a child with poor attachment is desperate to attach. And so they will actually, uh, wherever they feel safe, begin to externalise what they do. In other words, if you're uh, addressing difficult behaviours in your classroom with children who come from a vulnerable, uh, vulnerable background, they are most likely to be causing um, uh, challenges in the environment where they are safest, which is often with you or with the teachers or with the head teachers. And so the reason why that might be challenging is it feels like we're, we're always catching it. But the reason it's always good is that that means we've got an opportunity to respond to that and actually let this child know that they are precious. Now, the difficulty with some of these subjects is that um, uh, you might say, well, actually, it's too late then. It's, uh, how could, if I, this child's got poor attachment, it's all gone. And, and let me tell you, right, it's like a, a vegan's mantra. And um, when I'm working with parents, the most common question I'm asked is, am I too late? Is it too late? Is it too late to build a relationship? Is it too late to, 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 to reach out to my children? And I tell you this, it is never too late. It's like a, a belief system that we have that every child can be reached, every child. And, and this is backed up by the science. And the science is uh, under a body of neuroplasticity. And what this is essentially getting at is the brain can recover. So sure, if we don't have those early engagements as a child, and we're looking up at mum and dad, and, and our brain and some neural pathways are all kicking off, and it's all going amazing in our brain, if we don't have that, it's not too late. The brain can recover. In the same way that, you know, if you, have a, uh, if you, if you know someone who's had a car accident and they've had some uh, uh, head trauma or damage, the brain will reteach itself. They'll have to learn to perhaps walk again or talk again. Or we can recover equally from the trauma, from an emotional trauma or, 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 or any issues that are overwhelming us. The brain can learn. It is literally plastic. It can be reformed. And that ability to recover is essential to everything I'm saying today. So um, resilience has obviously been the word um, that's on everybody's lips for the last four or five years, and it's lost a bit of its meaning. Um, and also people are saying, you know, we've lost a bit of what do we mean, not, not mean by just the word, but what, what does it mean effectively in a child's life? What can they do if they've got that? And, and also, how do you get it? And there's loads of this, loads of information out there. Um, but for today, we're looking at uh, what Public Health England um, uh, released a, a couple of years ago. And they looked at 10 factors in every child's life. In fact, <laughs> all of our lives, 
um, where actually these things can impact on us. Now, you don't necessarily have all 10. Now, straight off the bat, um, it, just talking about plasticity, I am one of those children that come from quite a difficult background, a very traumatic background, but I was able to recover because some of these other things on this particular wheel that hopefully you'll see on your screen were in place. Now, there are 10 of them. I'm just going to focus on three for the purposes of today. The first one is effective parenting. There is no doubt that parents are the primary source of building strong attachment and security in a child's life. There's no competition, but there is support because number two on the wheel talks about effective teaching. Now, the word effective is key. Surprisingly, you might say, uh, why doesn't it say loving or, or you know, really family time-ish? It says effective. Effective is describing uh, not just um, how we feel about a child, but actually the frameworks we build around them, about the safety, about how we endorse them, how we raise them, how we give them an identity, how we support them as they find their own identity. Uh, that's what effective means. And it also means the same in uh, the classroom for teachers. It's not saying, are you, are you good at teaching maths? Well, what it's saying to us as SENCOs and parent support workers and teachers is, are you creating a framework where this child can learn and thrive. It's interesting that it's number two. Now, let me spin you around the clock, if you like, to numbers five and six. So two different components, so uh, in total, 20% of the total. And we have beliefs that life has meaning, uh, uh, right next to faith, hope, and spirituality. And the word I want to focus on for today is hope. It is important for all of us that we have a sense of hope. Incredibly, the sense of hope builds resilience. The sense of hope is rooted in attachment. Without hope, it's very difficult for us to get our eyes off the immediate, where our feet are walking, if you like, in our day by day lives and begin to look to a future where actually joy or a, a, a change or positive change or, or great things are coming. Very easy example. In our day jobs, if we had to work 52 weeks a year, and I know right now some of you are saying, I'll resign, I'll resign. Well, that's kind of the point. If any of us had to work 52 weeks a year, like, firstly, who could do that? Who could do that, particularly in the world that we inhabit? But um, what we do is we work through these hours and we're looking forward to the holiday. We're looking forward to a time, if you like, of release where we can switch off and engage and relax. But hope, therefore, isn't something that is. Uh, it's intangible. I hope I become a millionaire. It's not like that. Hope is something that is rooted in the future, that is very solid, that we can see now but can't quite experience now. And part of our engagement with children is to make sure that they have hope. So, for example, from a public health England's perspective, they need to know that maths isn't um, is something that they have to endure, but they could be good at it. That, that, that actually, if they're having difficulties in the playground building relationships, that actually there is friendships for them. And we need to talk through what that might look like. We need to give them a hope that the today isn't forever. And we need it. I need it. Well, I need it. <laughs> COVID lockdown. I'm on about my millionth week of home, home educating. I need it. All right. But, but so do our kids. Much more so. And incredibly, that future hope builds resilience. Why might that be? Well, let's just took, take a look at their brain. And um, I've got a kind of a clicker in my hand, so I'm going to try and move this around so you have to bear with me a bit. Because I'm going to try and give you a kind of a working model of the, of the brain. And today, for today's purposes, we're going to look at, we're going to split the brain into three parts. Uh, a little bit painful for some of us, but hopefully uh, instructive. So for this, uh, we're going to just use our, our right hand and uh, we're just going to fold our thumb, if you like, over our, uh, uh, across our palm like that and then make a fist. So you've got a fist, but with the, with the thumb on the inside of the fist, right? And this is a model of the brain. Now, here where the nails are, where the, the little, little knuckles there, are they called knuckles? Um, knuckles um, and the nails, that's your prefrontal cortex. That's this part of your brain. That's where you do logic and, and reasoning and consequences and, 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 and so on, and you, you process stuff there, if you like. But if we do a little bit of brain surgery and lift up that prefrontal cortex, we begin to look, a little bit painful in my case, we begin to look at the limbic system. And the limbic system is the seat of our emotions. And we're going to talk about that in a bit more in a couple of minutes. And then underneath the limbic system, 
here, the base, right, at the base of the, the head here, is the reptilian system, and that deals with flight or fright. You may have actually done, uh, uh, it's, it's a fascinating part of the brain, you may have done seminars on the amygdala and, and re responding to trauma in the past. It, something that really, really, uh, there's so much exciting research going on in that area right now. But for today, we're not looking at the reptilian, and we're not looking at the prefrontal cortex. We are looking at the limbic system. Now, the seat of our emotions is a fascinating part of our brain. And the reason for that is twofold. Firstly, it is where we make decisions. And secondly, it has no capacity for language. Let me rephrase that for a moment. The limbic system, the seat of our emotions, is where we make decisions. But it has no capacity for language. What this means, very practically, is that we make decisions emotionally. And marketeers know this. So when you're being sold a car, you think that you might be buying that car rationally. You might think that using your uh, prefrontal cortex right here, that you've looked at the boot size, the, uh, the, the, the emissions, uh, the engine size, the miles per gallon, the, uh, how many seats it's got, and, and so on, and said, yes, I've, I've done a spreadsheet, and I have made this decision, and I've decided on all the balance of all the pros and cons that I'm going to drive this car. I I'm sorry to tell you, but that's not how you bought your car. Bear with me, as we imagine um, two different uh, drivers. One drives a, a 5 Series BMW and one drives a Prius. And the 5 Series BMW person thinks, I bought this because that's the kind of car I want. No, they didn't. They bought it because they watched an advert where their car was gliding through the mountains and fire was coming out of the road and their car wasn't scorched and there was no mud, even though they kept going through uh, loads of lakes and rivers and stuff and the water splashing everywhere and they had a clear cut jawline and they were completely uh, uh, beautiful in every single way. And, and they thought, I want it. And then what they did was they got the spreadsheet out and they did all the things and they rationalised the decision that they'd already made. And they knew that because the marketeers know that to speak to your decision making part of your ability, you don't put numbers on a screen. You put a lifestyle. You speak emotionally and they make the decision. There's no language being used. It's just all about you want this. And then we, we rationalise it up here. But we've also got... Uh, another class of driver, uh, a Prius driver, and they're saying, oh, uh, yes, I, I, I bought it because I want to care for the environment, and I, I've rationalised that, and that is my primary driver. And well, that is perhaps true, but what happened before that is, over a period of time, the images that have gone into your limbic system have begun to inform your views. Now, predominantly, whether that's uh, melting snow caps or whatever, you've begun to think, I will buy a car based on an emotional response to the information that's come into me or the imagery that's come into me, and then I will rationalise that and buy a Prius. What am I trying to say? If we want to communicate with each other, we have to communicate to the limbic system. If we want them, people to believe stuff or make decisions for us, we need to speak uh, to the limbic system, not the prefrontal cortex. Why does that matter? Well, because children who are vulnerable, uh, uh, when they're uh, 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 looking for how to behave or how to engage with other people, um, I can't or I have restricted ability to make a rational decision. So we say to them, don't do this or do that. Well, these are words being processed by their prefrontal cortex, and it just makes no sense to them. For example, we say to them, oh, uh, you know, you've done this and that is wrong. That is a, a, a logical uh, a process. That's great. Or we might say to them, how would that make um, a little Johnny feel? Because you've done that. And they would say, I don't really know, because actually this is all a bit confusing to me, because that's just a, a way of explaining or processing something that I don't understand. If you want to engage with a child, you have to demonstrate the message that you're trying to reach out to them with. You have to demonstrate it. For example, uh, you could say to a child, um, I really uh, admire your courage and the fact that you work hard. Or you could sit alongside them for five or ten minutes and actually go through some of their problems or whatever it is or whatever subject they're doing uh, uh, with them. Now, when you're doing that second one, what's actually happening is you are communicating, if you like, with the limbic system. They are seeing that you care for them. The words that come out of our mouths just don't impact them particularly, but the demonstration of it does. Why does this matter? Because a child who's particularly traumatized or had a difficult background or has got significant challenges in their life, needs, we need to engage with their limbic system so that they can make decisions like, am I safe? Am I approved of? And we need that because that's the root of attachment. 
But saying to a child, do this or do that, doesn't reach them. They're just unable to process that information. And as a consequence, this is what happens. We have a cycle of isolation, and I'm very grateful to uh, Dr. Pookie uh, Knight-Smith, who uh, is an amazing speaker. Uh, and I, I, I really strongly encourage that you're following her. And, uh, I was listening to her talking about the cycle of isolation, and this really made sense to me. The cycle of isolation is, uh, of isolation is something that perhaps many of us start with, but we can break out of it at some point. It's like a catch-22, if you like. And it starts off with the fact, the re obvious recognition that we all have emotions. But if we are not able to regulate or understand those emotions, we can sometimes feel quite overwhelmed. And that sense of overwhelming can uh, be really impacted when a crisis in, uh, uh, happens. Uh, when we fail a test, when uh, we're ridiculed by our friends, when um, uh, there's a family break. And these kinds of things that happen in life and actually you know, cause immense challenges for children. Now, someone with strong resilience can actually build through that. They've got strong attachment. They can begin to manage that. But someone without that is swept away and it's very difficult. And so what they do is they look for a coping me method. Now, for you or I, um, or for many children, that will be going to the pastoral lead, to the Senko, to uh, mum or dad, to friends. But if we don't have access to a coping mechanism, we'll look for another one. And vegans' reason for existence is that children look for the other one, maybe self-harm, maybe controlled eating, whatever those things are that are very difficult, but they allow that child a moment of relief and perhaps release. But they know that doesn't work for them. They know at some level that that's not right. They know that. And so actually, they begin to feel guilt. And the problem with that is you have this perfect circle beginning, this catch-22, where they're feeling guilt, which is a big emotion, and they start to feel overwhelmed, and then that other crisis might, the same crisis or a new one might just impact them, and they begin the whole cycle again and again and again. And, you know, a child with good attachment, with good resilience, we can break into that. But the children that we're talking about today are those who don't have access to that. The outcome of that is this from uh, NHS Digital. And this is really talking about the prevalence of uh, diagnosable mental health uh, disorders. Uh, and uh, in this graph, uh, girls are represented by blue and boys by orange. And roughly speaking, you've got three sets there. You've got primary school, and then you've got secondary school and college, if you like. At primary school, you'll see that the boys have double the prevalence of girls. At secondary school, it begins to equal out. At college, girls race ahead. They race ahead until 23.9, nearly one in four girls has a diagnosable mental health disorder at the ages of 17 to 19. But how do we get there? Well, let me just backtrack slightly and look at that first bar chart. And I would say, uh, as I look at that, that that's not the experience that vegans sees in practice. Um, the reason perhaps that boys are, are far more prevalent than girls at primary school is they tend to externalise their behaviours, it's aggression and it's playing out and so on. With girls perhaps it's more internalised, if you like, boys take it out externally, girls turn on themselves. At secondary school you can begin to see they are able to articulate that and, and actually they become on the radar because it's more observable, it's more understandable and they catch up. But then as college approaches, uh, a plethora of pressures from the internet onwards, and we know them all and we're familiar with them all, begin to really burden a whole generation of young women. And actually that's the outcome. And I speak as a dad of two 14 year olds and a 16 year old. So these numbers speak very personally to me. At some point, we need to break into that cycle. At some point. I think if we were to draw together some of the things I've just gone through right now, we would say that to effectively address behaviours in the classroom, we have to understand the roots of that behaviour and adjust strategies so that we are anticipating and reducing them in the, in the first behaviour in the first place, rather than simply trying to manage it when it comes out full fold. And so that's what the remaining of these slides are, is really trying to address how do we, how do we reduce and manage, uh, how do we reduce and engage with that? 
So before I say my next bit, um, I am about to uh, say something which is causing me to wince even as I say it. Uh, yes, um, we are educators. We are not the parents of these children. Um, so please, please, uh, when I go on to say what I'm going to say, uh, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. We can't uh, substitute the role of a parent, we can't. And uh, nor am I asking that. Um, but what I would say, uh, and the reason why some of the parenting strategies that we might uh, suggest in a moment to uh, work, is that attachment works anyway. I once saw a BBC documentary, and there was this um, county lines uh, a gang leader there, and he was talking about how he recruits uh, young uh, boys and girls, 10, 11 years old, to carry drugs and weapons into different counties. And uh, I was fascinated by how he did it. He waited by the school gate and he would look for uh, kids who were not uh, 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 with mum or dad, perhaps uh, looking a bit run down in one, one or two different ways, and, and, and not surrounded by friends. And he would become their friend. And uh, the, the question that the interview, the BBC interview was trying to get at is, how do you persuade a 10 or 11 year old who's going to school one day to carry drugs and weapons for you the next? And the answer is, he became their friend built that level of trust and he could make requests. Having, having reached their limbic system, having demonstrated that he is for them, he then can ask things of them that naturally would seem impossible from the outside. So the strategies work. We can't be parents, but we know that they can work. All right, so um, I'm going to suggest a few ways that we could bring parenting strategies into the classroom so that we can give some of these children a chance to build that resilience and break, if you like, that catch-22 and allow them to just build in, if you like, into the rock of security that, uh, as best as we can, we can provide for them in the school context. Now, the thing that we always talk about uh, when we're dealing with um, uh, families that are going through a difficult time and are working alongside them uh, is stuff like intentional approval. Now, um, we might think that approvals are quite straightforward, you know, you do a good job and uh, you, you get honoured for that or you get rewarded for that or paid for that, you know, whatever. Um, intentional approval is slightly different to that and it's really honouring people for doing what they're supposed to do. Right? And actually, if you think about it, it does make sense. Um, if, I, uh, if I give my um, child a fiver, they go, oh, that's great. But if I say wash a car and then I'll give you the fiver, the approval, the five pound note that goes towards them is like, well, I earned that, you know. That doesn't mean anything, but if I if I think wash a car and I go wow that's really amazing and and I give them that approval in that context or I just walk up to them and say here's a fiver they go wow that's amazing. The point I'm trying to make is probably quite poorly actually, but the point I'm trying to make is we need to be able to say to a child who does their homework, well done you did your homework, uh, well done you did all ten maths questions or you did that that you know that essay assignment really really well, well done you you hung your, your coat up. And you'd say to me, why am I going to tell them well done for something that they should have done anyway? But that, that approval, that approval is how we begin to speak to the limbic system. That's how we get past the prefrontal cortex, all the information. They know when they're supposed to do it, but when they get honoured for doing it, they're going, huh, that's cool. And honestly, do it publicly. And honour them for stuff that isn't just kind of running the mill. When they, when they open the door, thank you for that kindness. Uh, when you see them uh, help another student, wow, you're so generous with your time. You're generous. Do it publicly. It would, it's, like, it's like, instead of going a fiver for washing the car, it's like 500 pounds. The impact is magnifold. The more people observe that, a public endorsement, the more that person goes, I am. Uh, valued, I am adored. And it comes right back to that parent go, I love you, I'm for you, I, 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 I will never abandon you. Well, we're kind of doing that in a different way, but it, we're doing the same thing. We're building those neural pathways because what they're hearing is, when you say thank you for opening the door, what they're hearing is, I approve of you. You've impressed me. And then a couple of other kind of things that we talk to parents about that might be supportive in the classroom. And I'm not uh, daring to venture on that, how you manage behaviours, but just stuff that because actually if they're not able to process using their prefrontal cortex very well, they may not be able to process um, uh, uh, instructions as we give them. Now, for today's purposes, um, I'm just going to use the word command, but just go with that if that's OK. And, and we use uh, different commands, um, we, we suggest different commands to parents. It's not command, you do this, but it's just, it just summarises how, how to uh, get your child to do something that is really important, like not walk in the middle of the road or uh, eat the vegetables or whatever the thing is. And one of the things that we use is if 
then. If then. Now, got a poor attachment and you're not really sure about how the rest of the world is operating, then we need to reach them in a way that um, they do what we need them to do inside the, inside the family or the classroom, uh, but, but means that they're not trying to understand our world. And the way of doing that is to say, um, uh, a teacher can have more uh, uh, black paint. And you say, well, if you finish what you've got, then you can. Or if they say, uh, uh, I, you know, can you help me with my, uh, I, I, you know, they, they're putting their hand up, you know, in, over and over again in class. If you're, if you, if you allow others to speak for five minutes, then I will, I, I will ask uh, for your, your insight into that. If you do this, then I'll do that. Now, the, the reason it's powerful is it, it's not known. And a child uh, with challenging backgrounds will have heard a lot of no's. In fact, we've all heard a lot of no's, but it's not known. And no is very difficult for them to process up here. But if then means that you're speaking to the limbic system saying, I have heard you. And children, um, when, they are, uh, 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 when they are often uh, uh, exhibiting challenging behaviours, um, one of the things that they're looking for is, have you understood that I am anxious, that I am frustrated, that I am uh, angry? If then speaks directly to that, I have heard what you want, but I'm asking for something in return. And you're going to get it, but you need to do this first, if then. The other thing that we can do that is, I see that you are frustrated. Many children have an overwhelming sense of emotions and they don't know why. And actually being able to name it is a bit like if they're climbing up Everest, where Everest is where they're at peace, just go with this room, right? They're climbing up peace and they're trying to act out to try and get that, hear me, hear me, hear me. When we say, um, I see that you are frustrated, We've almost got them to base camp. They know that they've been seen. They've got, they've got heard. You're speaking to their limbic system. I see your emotions. I see what's happening there, right there. Now they're not aware of all of these concepts, but neither is my baby in my hands, but she knows that she's safe. We can say, I see that you are anxious. And they go, ooh. Single stage um, instructions. Single stage instructions are um, often in uh, school context, we, we say, well, uh, it turns page 34, do the questions one through five, don't do the odd ones, uh, go to the back, check them, swap those answers with your next or uh, name and see how it goes. And then uh, someone who's really struggling, um, uh, you know, they've got a lot of stuff going on inside their heads already, their prefrontal cortex is just buzzing over with stuff that's happened to them over the weekend or at home or whatever. They're not going to be able to process that. And so we take it all the way back down to single stage commands. And so that uh, they can just, get, just turn to page 34. And then, and then, and perhaps uh, ask your teachers, uh, or if you're a teacher, uh, write their stuff up on the board, on the whiteboard, so they've got something to go by. It just, it's just supporting them, and it means that they're not getting frightened or anxious, even as they sit there. And, and that leads me on to spot the signs. Um, the big trigger about mental health, you know, when people refer, are referred into us, the most common thing is not that they are withdrawn or particularly outgoing, it's when they change. It's when they change. Spot the ch change in behaviours um, and, uh, you know, if, they, if they're going from outgoing to suddenly withdrawn, be aware of that and get alongside that child. Hey, tell me what's going on inside your heart right now. Let's, let's talk that through. Um, and, and also, they obviously might have tells, but again, that's um, uh, perhaps a, a conversation for another day. Um, so, just to run through a couple of thoughts uh, of strategies that we've seen schools do and we actually apply where we are. Um, the first one is to, uh, if you're looking at your school and your school resources, thinking we haven't got the resources or the capacity or the people power to be able to, uh, to respond in the way that we're hearing today. Well, um, what you can often do is partner with a local charity or church uh, and tell them what you need. Right? Put the burden on them. We need, we need people to come and read. We need uh, people to come and spend an hour a week with uh, you know, five children or whatever. And, and there are amazing charities out there who are doing work just like that. We do that. Um, the other thing is you're saying, well, we, we, you know, we need, a, we need a sensory room or something like that. Um, you can't do it, but actually a charity may bid for that money for you and deliver the services for you. And you might think that could never happen. Um, but we operate at about 140 schools every year. Uh, we're in 100 schools uh, each week. And uh, the vast majority of that 140 schools, about 80 schools, 
um, our money, we are, are, bid, are, are paid for by us bidding on behalf of the schools for the funds to then go and do the work in the schools. So it works. It can be done. And it's a strategy that means you might be able to get mentoring, might be able to get therapy, might be able to get group work, might be able to get um, specialist toys and so on, might be able to get readers. This is a strategy that we can really uh, expand the armory of, 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 of tools that you've got at your disposal. Uh, setting up a safe room, you probably know all about that, uh, but we've seen amazing results um, uh, where that's been done. Structured timetable. Uh, the root of anxiety often is uh, the unknown. And for, uh, again, for vulnerable, for all children, for me, you know, I get anxious. Anxiety in itself is not necessarily a bad thing, but it can begin to escalate when there are too many unknowns in any of our lives. And, and actually reducing those unknowns for our kids as best as we can. It's not going, oh, it's raining. OK, uh, we'll do painting. That will actually be quite shaky to someone who's already got a number of unknowns, those anxiety levels. And go back to that circle. That will be one of those kind of overwhelming moments. They may not be able to deal with that. And you may see the acting out happen then. If they can't cope, be flexible. And um, what we're seeing here is that uh, one of our experiences um, that we're seeing in, in our classrooms, in, in the therapy work we're doing, is that children um, who've come from quite a traumatic background um, are of, often um, exhibiting similar symptoms to those who've got autistic spectrum conditions. So children who are coming from a, a, a traumatic background are not autistic themselves, but they exhibit similar symptoms to those kids that have autistic spectrum uh, condi uh, 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 conditions. And so we have begun to apply over the last few years um, parenting strategies or, or, or therapeutic strategies that kind of meet that where it is, just making everything predictable, uh, getting structure involved. So as much as positive praise and time and all that sort of stuff, we're also focusing on um, re reducing the unknowns and, 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 and us as parents and the school environment being as, as adaptable to that if they can. If you can set aside consistent talk time, just, just let them pour out, that'd be amazing. Um, uh, and a very powerful thing um, that we see work in many uh, schools. However, all right, the difficult moment does come because of course, uh, schools are not number one on that cycle. It is uh, parents who are number one. We are the primary source as parents uh, to these children. And actually, if the burden of this falls uh, Italian schools, uh, a, I, you know, I think just the, the, the sheer weight of that burden uh, falling on Senkos and the teachers is just too much. And we're seeing too much of that already as, you know, teachers are, uh, and Senkos are becoming, you know, almost management accountants as they analyse data and, and therapists and social workers and all that sort of stuff. So this, you know, the, we, at some point we have to say, well, actually, uh, we don't think it's going to be an effective strategy for our vulnerable children and our nation if we do that. We have to look to home. And that's very difficult, you know, and I speak as someone <laughs> who's had these conversations about approaching parents. Um, but partly we've overcome that by, um, uh, by, by how we do it. If we go to a parent and say, your child is struggling, or if we go to a parent and we say this, uh, you know, we think you're not doing a great job. Now, you know, people have said that to me, you know, and it's not a pleasant thing to be on the receiving end of and go back to the limbic system, or my, you know, spoken to me very, very powerfully to my limbic system, and I am going to respond emotionally, regardless of what the word said, prefrontal cortex, I know what you're really saying. But do you know what? I've been on parenting courses and when I was on my last parenting training course, like an update thing, I was like, oh my goodness, I've not done that with my kids. Do you know what? No one parent has got the hang of it. And that can translate to how we, we talk about parents, parenting with parents. And we can say, well, look, you know, I was struggling, you know, and this resource was really helpful to me. Um, don't worry, we've got some free resources so you can, you can point them to something. This resource is really helpful to me. I wonder if it would help you. And they'll say, uh, are you saying that my, my daughter and my son is, you know, you know, it's a no, no, but we all could do with help, right? They didn't come with a manual. Here's a manual. Let's, you know, let's, let's, let, you know, maybe this would be great. And it's something that we're doing. Or perhaps you could look at a whole school approach. The resources that we might be able to um, support you with, um, if it helps, as you come alongside your parents like that, heart to heart. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not finished there. There's one other thing. A lot of our parents, I've had two heads of parenting who were parents that we worked with first. Uh, a lot of our parent support workers uh, we've recruited from uh, work that we've done. Why? 
because nothing is as powerful as someone coming alongside a parent and they say, you don't know my story. And then that parent says back to them, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. And so we produce resources and they're, they're here to support that and support you as perhaps you're looking outside of the school at this. And I don't want to put a burden on you because that's a huge burden. But I'm trying to, if you like, make it, um, you know, and say well, this could really be effective for, for managing some of that stuff in the classroom if we go back to the root source of it. So we've got something called Parenting in a Pandemic. It's huge. Um, it's gone out to uh, a lot of people, <laughs> uh, hundreds and I think thousands now of people. It was an animated series, series that we put together very, very quickly um, at the beginning of uh, lockdown one. And uh, we released it out. And it goes out, you know, when you sign up to it, it's free. Parents sign up to it themselves, it's free. And it's like five minute videos about this and this and this, and five minute uh, animated videos. And then after that, they get parenting tips each week. Just kind of, you know, keep us all on the right path. I signed up, you know, so I get my parenting tip uh, emailed into me. And it's, it's very powerful. And yeah, I've, I've not done that for a while. Second thing is, uh, with Scudio, uh, we produced um, uh, foundations of mental health and school environment, and, and that's free. So uh, up till now, uh, I, I don't know what we charge that out, a lot, uh, but uh, I was talking to Ian Richardson at Scudio, and just, we just really felt that as part of this series that he's running, it's really important for us, if you like, to put our money where our mouth is, and we want to release that and bless that into schools. So we've made a decision to give that away, that 12-part uh, training course uh, for free. And the other thing that's coming up, uh, uh, which we are, is again, it's going to be digitally based, is train the trainer in terms of how to do parenting. So that if you've got a local uh, group, organisation, church, round table, whatever, who want to get involved with parents locally, and believe it or not, there's often groups that do want to do that. It's often how we do our work. Uh, we're, we're releasing in about six weeks' time train the trainer uh, videos called Real Parenting. And it's really about uh, producing materials so that people can feel confident in training. They can feel confident to lead a parenting group and go through stuff. And of course, um, uh, you know, we'd be delighted to support you in that and look through what that might be. For some of you, um, you've heard, you guys do counselling in schools. What? What is that? OK, so we have a really effective model uh, where we roll out counselling um, uh, to school clusters, so it's like in the town. Uh, we recruit locally therapists who are qualified and experienced in working with vulnerable children, uh, and then we deploy them. And the, the schools gather together, they bear the cost of that. Uh, often we fundraise alongside them to do that so that it's heavily subsidised. Uh, and, and, but what happens is uh, each school gets 18 weeks of counselling where they can have you know, two or three kids being seen each week for 18 weeks. So, the, 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 you know, the children more at the top of the iceberg are really struggling with issues. Uh, we can come alongside you and support you in that. Um, uh, Tia's uh, email address, she, she does all the, the partnerships with clusters, is there. Uh, Tia.barham at vegans.org.uk. Um, but rather bravely and perhaps wholeheartedly, um, uh, there are my contact details, including my mobile. Uh, and I would love to talk to you about your situation. If you, you wanted me to unpack anything that you've heard today, I'd be delighted to do that. But my heart, overriding, more than anything else, is for you, is for you. I am grateful for the work that you've done in my family's life, in my children's friends' life. Um, I remember uh, the teachers that supported me. And Mrs. Seely, if you ever hear this, I bless you. I've blessed Mrs. Seely many times because she stood by me when my own personal life went down the toilet all those years ago. And, and I, 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 my heart here is to just equip you to better look at some of these things and give you encouragement that you're doing a great job, a great, great job. And even if it feels difficult and even if it feels dark, rest assured you are transforming lives. And, and I'm just very proud to have been given the opportunity to speak into that and hopefully give you some thoughts and pointers and be with you on your journey as you care for the children that you want to give hope to. So for today, thank you very much. Bye bye. Hey, it's Ian here at Studio TV. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at Getting It Right For Me Live. Let me ask you a really quick question. Are you here because you are hoping to develop your skills and your knowledge and all your learning and understanding around supporting and caring for children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities? I assume that's what you've come here for. We hope that you're enjoying um, your time here with us. There's some amazing people and we're so grateful for them um, coming and being part of this. And we're so grateful for you to be joining us as well. There's a couple of things I just really quickly wanted to introduce you to. First of all, don't forget that you can upgrade your ticket at any time to one of the 
paid tickets, which we try to keep the price as low as we possibly can just to cover what we need to help out the speakers a little bit um, and make sure this event is as good as it can be. What that means is you can access the live Q&A sessions that we're running throughout the event and you can access all the sessions for up to a year afterwards if you buy one of those paid tickets. Check out the whole school ones. How that works is if you book the whole school ticket and you can pay online or you can drop us a line and we'll issue an invoice and we'll sort it all out, that's absolutely fine. But we'll then make it possible for all your staff to be able to access all the sessions here at Getting It Right For Me Live this year. So do hope that's helpful. The other thing I want to mention is, and there are lots of members joining us this week, so thank you so much to those of you who are members, but we have put together, if you're looking to go deeper and access ongoing support and help and training, either as an individual, as a parent, as a professional supporting someone with additional needs, in, in a school or educational setting, or from a professional point of view, we have put together here at Scudia TV with Lynn McCann and her team at Reach Out ASC, a fantastic membership that starts at just £10 a month and includes a wide range of courses to help you support those in your care. There's a load of resources and tools, printable um, things that you can use to work with those children and support them. And there's more content being added all the time. One of my favorite parts of the membership is there is a, a, a peer group community that's built into that. So you can ask questions of Lynn and her team and your peers built right into that membership as well. As I say, it starts at just £10 a month whole school memberships are there we're offering trust wide memberships and local authorities have started to get in touch and offer this to their to um, their staff across a range of schools as well we would love for you to join our community if you've got any questions on that drop us a line i um, but very much hope to see you there and thank you so much enjoy the rest of the day. <music>